Good evening. I'm Rami Khouri, the director of the Hassan Faris Institute for Public Policy and International Affairs at the American University of Beirut, the only institution in the Arab world that starts its events five minutes before scheduled time. <laughs> And we do that so we can give our honored speaker five extra minutes of speaking time. Um, President Carter, President Dorman, excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, friends, students, colleagues, university staff, and especially the Hassan Faris Institute uh, Faculty Advisory Committee and staff. Thank you all for coming out here tonight on this very special occasion, uh, which is the inaugural official opening of the Bill and Sally Hambrecht Distinguished Peacemakers Lecture Series at the American University of Beirut under the auspices of the Isam Fadis Institute for Public Policy and International Affairs. That's a very long title, but it's also a very rich title when you consider the individuals, the institutions, and the principles that they embody. Uh, distinguished Peacemakers is a title that we gave to this lecture series that Bill and Sally Hambrecht funded uh, for us because we thought it was important to bring to AUB in Beirut and the Middle East a series of 10 experienced mediators in political conflicts all around the world who have real world experience who can share with us uh, the lessons of that mediation and to interact with the community here at AUB and Beirut. And it was, when it comes to distinguished peacemakers, they don't come any better than Jimmy Carter. We're very pleased to have him. The name, the title peacemaker, of course, comes from the holy books. All of the holy books talk of making peace and reconciliation. But peace is also a word that Arabs and Muslims use every day at least 10 or 20 or 30 times. The salam alaikum greeting is a common structural element of Arab culture, of Arab identity, and the instinct to live in peace and solidarity and tolerance and respect with our fellow citizens. Salam alaikum is the normal greeting that Arabs and Muslims use every day, many times uh, throughout their life. So peace is, is a, is a is a concept that is not only dear to us as citizens and as nationals, but is also structurally embedded uh, in our social niceties and our human day-to-day, minute-to-minute exchanges. But we have a special convergence here of individuals, of institutions, and of values. It is a privilege for me personally and for my staff and colleagues to be at the Hassan Faris Institute, which Hassan Faris uh, endowed very generously at AUB. In a few years, we will have that beautiful building over there uh, that is now an image but is soon to be a, a reality. And the mission of the Hassan Faris Institute is to build on the rich research work that is done by the AUB faculty. Uh, probably the single most um, richest um, collection of research scholars um, in, in the Arab world, perhaps, 350, 400 uh, research professor and another 1,000 graduate students. Uh, our mission is to build on that and to take the fruits of research and to use them to impact on public policy making and international affairs. We've launched a series of programs on, on climate change, on um, youth-related issues all around the Arab world, on Palestinian refugee camps and their host communities all over the Middle East. We pick the tough issues, but the tough issues that need serious research and analysis and the convening power of an institution like AUB that can bring together researchers, NGOs, government officials, foreign diplomats, international organizations, the private sector that can bring together the people that need to analyze these tough issues in an integrated and honest way. We see the Hassan Faris Institute as taking the good work that AUB already does and transmitting it one step further into the community, into the region, and through our international affairs into the world. Uh, 
The Bill and Sally Hambrick Distinguished Peacemakers Lecture Series is a new element that the Ehsan Faris Institute has launched uh, that brings us into a new field, which is not deeply entrenched at AUB, conflict resolution and peacemaking. Uh, we've introduced this lecture series as a way to generate new momentum, and it's already generating interest in other activities that we will be built around it, and it brings to AUB very experienced peacemakers and mediators from conflicts all over the world to interact with our students and faculty and conflict resolution practitioners from all around uh, the region. We will have this series when it's done uh, produced in a book and we will have a video and this will be shared with conflict resolution people and perhaps even with diplomats and officials all over the world to get the fruits of the best experience of real life uh, researchers and uh, of uh, real life mediators. Um, I want to thank uh, just one more time uh, Bill and Sally Hambrecht for endowing the series, uh, Isam Faris and his family for endowing uh, our institute, and uh, all of the colleagues at AUB um, who make our work uh, possible. Uh, with that, I would like to ask uh, Bill Hambrecht to come up to say a few words. Uh, and then President Dorman will introduce President Carter. Thank you. Thank you, Rami. Uh, it is a, a, pleasure, a pleasure and a thrill to be here tonight. Uh, I, uh, and Sally and I became involved with the American Friends, uh, or American Quakers, however you want to put it, in there some of their peacemaking activities over the years and, and, and more primarily in their educational activities. And it's always been a passion for both of us to try and find common ground where people can come together and find a way of resolving conflicts uh, in a peaceful manner that benefits everybody. So we have a deep philosophical attachment to this cause. And when I went on the board of AUB, five or six years ago, I believe it was, I got to know so many of the committed and wonderful members of this faculty that had done so much work and, and had so much to offer in the way of understanding the issues. And then I was introduced to Rami, and this is like being introduced to a force of nature. <laughs> and this has all happened with his energy and, of course, the support from everyone at AUB. AUB is a great university. Uh, I think it's the most perfect platform for this type of activity. The Islam Faris Institute, I think, will become a force uh, that will hopefully change the intellectual atmosphere and the whole context of Middle East peace movement. Uh, the other thing I'm thrilled about, of course, is that over the years, uh, President Carter has been uh, one of my personal heroes. I think he, has, he was a great president in a very difficult time in the United States, uh, but I don't think there's any president in history who has contributed so much to mankind than he has since he left office. I mean, it, it is a tribute to his, uh, his deep-seated beliefs, his values, and his ability to bring people together uh, to basically help the world. I, I can't think of a better man to start our lecture series than President Carter. Thank you for coming. President Carter, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, Many presidents of the United States have left a track record of honorable public service and principled leadership in a role that the modern American media frequently refer to with some hubris as a leader of the free world. In our generation, however, only Jimmy Carter has pioneered a mission and crafted a legacy that has lasted far beyond the years he actually served in that high office. The universal esteem in which he is held across the globe 
reflects the depth and the consistency of his emphasis on moral values as the foundation for political conduct at home and abroad. Mr. Carter assumed the American presidency just over 30 years ago with his hallmark smile and a powerful commitment to human rights as the defining driver of American foreign policy. In his inaugural speech on January 20th, 1977, he asserted, our commitment to human rights must be absolute, our laws fair, our natural beauty preserved, the powerful must not persecute the weak, and human dignity must be enhanced. And uh, doubtless many of you read just two days ago in a column in the Washington Post where Mr. Carter wrote, the advancement of human rights and democracy is necessary for global stability and can be achieved only through the local, often heroic, efforts of individuals who speak out against injustice and oppression. Endeavor is the United States should lead, not impede. As surely as there is heroism in local activism for human dignity, President Carter, there is also an inspiring valor in the abiding moral and political leadership you and a handful of other prominent men and women around the world provide by the example of the commitments you have made in your life. Your presence at the American University of Beirut has deep significance for us. For over 140 years, AUB has been dedicated to a quest founded on the values that you embrace. Through educating and inspiring young men and women, we seek to forge more stable societies, more equitable economic systems, more effective governance, and a world of hope that honors the dignity of our shared humanity and the natural integrity of our planet. So ladies and gentlemen, it is a distinct honor to introduce to you this evening a man with a unique resume. A farmer from Georgia, the 39th President of the United States, and winner of the Nobel Peace Prize, President Jimmy Carter. Thank you. Well, let me say, first of all, I really thoroughly enjoyed that introduction. <laughs> it's a great honor and pleasure for me to come to this great university, about which I've heard all my adult life. As a, a stable beacon of uh, intellectual achievement, a commitment to the finest aspects of human life, and has survived in, with its in, integrity uh, in, intact, even during the most difficult of uh, challenges from foreign invaders and from rapid changes within your own society. And I'm very grateful for a chance to come and participate this evening. We've had a constant series of banquets since we got here. Uh, all have been uh, blessed with delicious Lebanese food. Uh, last night, I was, attended a banquet with the Prime Minister, and, and I started my response to his extensive toast uh, by saying that uh, one of my favorite cartoons was in the New York Times this past, uh, it was in the New Yorker magazine this past year. It's a little boy looking up at his father, and he says, Daddy, when I grow up, I want to be a former president. <laughs> well, you can see why tonight, because I have this honor to come here and, and visit around. Well, after I was involuntarily retired from the White House in 1980, results of the election when, when um, Ronald Reagan won, 
I've had a good chance of being uh, involved in the academic world. I'm now in my 27th year as a so-called distinguished professor at Emory University uh, in Atlanta, Georgia. And every September for 27 times, I've begun my years teaching or lecturing by having um, a town meeting with about 3,500 uh, students who spend a full hour asking me any question they want to ask. I never know what to expect. Uh, I'm almost always, I started to say disappointed, I'm almost always titillated, and uh, this has been a wonderful po possibility for me to stay involved in the academic life of my country. I also have four children of my own. I have uh, 11 grandchildren, and I have one and almost two great-grandchildren. My second one will be born uh, in just a few days, so I have a very good life at home. We still live in the same village where my wife and I were born. We've owned the same land that I still cultivate uh, since 1833. So you might say that my wife and I have not gotten anywhere in life. We, we're still where we started off. As a matter of fact, when I was four years old, I lived next door to my future wife, who was then one year old. So we've been very close together. And, and we've uh, just passed our 62nd uh, wedding anniversary, so we still <laughs> I've been asked to discuss tonight um, the 30 years after Camp David, and I'll try to stick to my subject and keep my remarks as brief as possible uh, so that I can spend a maximum amount of time answering any questions that you might want to present to me. When I was elected president in 1976, there had been four major wars in the Middle East in the previous 25 years. And I was faced with the challenge of um, an oil embargo against my country and a secondary boycott against any corporation in my nation that did business with Israel. This was imposed by the, uh, by the Arab uh, OPEC members. And I resolved, even before I was elected president, that I would do what I could to bring peace to Israel and to the Palestinians and to the other nations around them, and human rights and justice to the Palestinian people. I began my efforts and was um, meeting with all of the leaders of this region as quickly as I could uh, after I was inaugurated. I didn't wait even one month before I started this task. Uh, everyone came to America to meet with me except uh, President Assad, who told me indirectly that he would never visit America, and he never did. So when I was at the uh, Economic Summit in London in June of 1977, I flew over to Geneva and met with him. So I had a, a wide range of experience very early in discussing the various aspects of the peace process, primarily the obstacles to be overcome with the leaders who were and had been involved. I was very distressed uh, in, uh, to, when Israel elected Menachem Begin as a president, as a prime minister, because it seemed uh, obvious to me that he would not be a person amenable to a peace negotiation. Early in his career as the head of Irgun, as you may remember, he was branded by the British as a foremost terrorist in this region after 96 people were killed in an explosion in the uh, King David Hotel. But I met with Menachem Begin, and I found, as is the case now, that the American president has a great influence with the leaders of Israel. And that has grown and still holds, in my opinion, the foremost opportunity for progress in the near future. I began to negotiate between Menachem Begin and Anwar Sadat. The primary issue on which we spent 13 days in total isolation at Camp David was Palestinian rights. The first 10 days, the first three days, I met in a, a small room with me and Prime Minister Begin and President Sadat. But they were so completely incompatible and never could get beyond arguing about the past 
that for the last 10 days at Camp David, I never let them see each other. So Begin stayed in his cabin, Sadat stayed in his cabin, and I went back and forth between the two to negotiate. We got to the final day, I'll be brief about this, and uh, we thought we had failed because there was an insuperable difference between them. Sadat was quite flexible, that we had to have a complete commitment to the, uh, to the Palestinian rights, and also all Israeli settlers had to be removed from Egyptian territory. On the other hand, Prime Minister Begin had taken an oath before God that he would never dismantle an Israeli settlement. That seemed to be an impossibility to resolve. And in the last day, Begin and Sadat and I were packing to go back to Washington in defeat. And Begin asked me if I would sign some photographs of me and Begin and, uh, and Sadat for his grandchildren. My secretary discovered by calling Israel the names of his grandchildren. Instead of signing just best wishes, I signed best wishes too, and I wrote the name of each of his grandchildren and took them over to his cabin. He was quite angry with me at that time and he said, thank you, Mr. President. He was very proper and he turned around and he began to read the names of his grandchildren one by one and tears ran down his cheeks and mine because he realized that if we didn't succeed that his grandchildren would face sustained conflict. I went back to my cabin and in a few moments his assistant, who later was the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, came and said, let's try one more time. And we did. So why, the way we resolved it was that Begin withdrew himself from the decision concerning the settlement and let the Israeli parliament, the Knesset, make the decision and they voted 85 percent to dismantle the settlement. They also voted overwhelmingly for the commitments that Begin had made concerning the Palestinians, that they would have full autonomy and that all Israeli military and political forces would be withdrawn from the West Bank and Gaza. That was the agreement. We had another aspect that was negotiated six months later, and that was a treaty of, a treaty of peace between Israel and Egypt. That was in April of 79, and in just a few months, it'll be 30 years. Not a word of that peace treaty has been violated. But the Palestinian rights have not been honored. Almost steadily since that time, the Palestinians living in the West Bank and Gaza have seen their basic human rights lost step by step. Well, where do we go from here? We have uh, seen some faltering efforts. Uh, I would say that uh, President Bill Clinton made an all-out effort by going back to Camp David, but it was in the last year of his term. Instead of beginning at the initiation when his prestige and influence was greatest, and as you may or may not know, uh, we had the same situation with George W. Bush, who for six years did not orchestrate one single day of negotiation. It was at that time that I decided to write a book about Palestine based on, I would say, intimate knowledge as much as any outsider could accrue of the life of the Palestinians under Israeli occupation. They have held three elections. One when the Palestinian Authority was established with 88 members of their so-called parliament and uh, Arafat was elected president. The Carter Center monitored that election. The second one was after Arafat's death for the election of Abu Mazen. And the third one was a year later when a new Palestinian Authority was elected with uh, Hamas participating for the first time in the national election and Hamas won that election uh, in a completely open, honest, fair, 
contest. I might say that the Carter Center has just completed our 73rd election in the world in Ghana this past weekend. But among those 73 elections, I would say the most perfect three were the ones conducted by the Palestinians because the Palestinian Election Authority, who supervise all aspects of the election, are distinguished uh, leaders who have been former uh, judges and former college presidents and whose reputations are beyond question. Well, that election results were aborted. I stayed there for a day or two after the election because I had heard that Abu Mazen was going to resign since he, his party, the Pata, lost the election. But I talked to him and I talked to some of the Hamas elected parliamentarians in Ramallah and, um, and he decided to stay on as the president. We tried very hard to get a unity government formed because Hamas offered Fatah uh, top positions of finance minister and foreign minister and so forth. But the decision was ultimately made, and I think it was a serious mistake, that they would not be uh, honored the results of the election. Since then, you have seen the deterioration of the Palestinian unity, so that now, in effect, uh, Hamas controls Gaza and Fatah uh, controls the West Bank. And this has meant that we are now in something of a stalemate, well, in fact, not something, we are in a stalemate between the uh, two. In the meantime, the Israelis have not uh, been willing to uh, negotiate in, in good faith with the Palestinians as far as the results have uh, seemed. Uh, and uh, we have been uh, trying very hard to do something about it from a very small perspective, that is the Carter Center. In April, uh, I went to, to Israel, uh, to the West Bank. We met with the Gaza Hamas leaders in Cairo. And then I went to Syria to meet with President Assad and the Hamas leaders in, uh, in Damascus. That was uh, a, a good learning experience for me. Uh, it, you may be interested in knowing that while we were in Jerusalem, we met with the leaders of peace organizations in Israel, all Israelis. There were a hundred of them, a hundred different organizations in Israel now dedicated to peace. And we met with their leaders in a large room. And, of course, the same situation exists on a smaller scale uh, in the West Bank. Well, I've now written another book that's going to be published uh, about a week after we have a new president in America. The name of my first book, some of you may have heard of it, uh, was called Palestine, Peace, Not Apartheid. The definition of apartheid is when two peoples occupy the same land and they are forcibly separated one from another and one of them dominates the other. And that's certainly the situation in the Palestinian territories. Uh, my next book will be called a much more uh, acceptable title uh, we can bring peace to the Holy Land, a plan that will work. And my hope is that we'll see a, a new movement toward a comprehensive peace in this entire region that would include you and Syria and, and Jordan and Egypt, as well as the Palestinians on both sides and the Israelis. It's the only ultimate way that the people in this region can live in peace and security and progress in harmony. Why do I say we can bring peace to the Holy Land? Well, the reason is that the legal framework for peace derives from five different sources as far as my country is concerned. First of all is the United Nations resolutions that establish the framework or the description of what people are bound to do. United Nations Resolution 242, for instance, says Israel shall withdraw from occupied territories. The United States government has the same policy. 
When I was president, uh, Israeli settlements were characterized by me and all my predecessors and my successors, some of them. The settlements were illegal and an obstacle to peace. Any settlements by Israel on Palestinian land. So my policy, my government's policy still, and the United Nations resolutions, that's two of them. Another one is the International Quartet, which comprises the United States, Russia, the European Union, and the United Nations. And they have spelled out very clearly the framework by which a final agreement can be reached between Israel and its neighbors. And they are identical to those that I have already described. Israel would withdraw from the occupied territories, that Jerusalem would be shared as a capital for both a new Palestinian state living alongside Israel, and that the right of return will be honored as prescribed in United Nations Resolution 194. So the basic framework of those three are identical. Another one is the so-called Geneva Accord, which may or may not be known as well by some of you. At the end of President Clinton's term in office, and even a day or two after President George W. Bush was sworn in, there was a meeting at, at Taba, and they continued their discussions between uh, representatives of the Israelis and representatives, not officials, but the people. And they concluded their agreement, and it was presented in, uh, in Geneva, Switzerland, I think in October of 2003. Uh, I knew about this process, and I was there, and I made the keynote address. There were about 200 Palestinians who came to Geneva. There were about 200 Israelis who came there. Uh, this agreement was endorsed publicly by President Clinton, uh, by Prime Minister Tony Blair from Great Britain, by President Chirac from uh, France and by about 200 other leaders from around the world. And it was later approved in a public opinion poll by both Palestinians and Israelis. So it's a framework that's very specific in, in how an agreement can be consummated. It does permit or advise that a small portion of the West Bank can be deeded to Israel, that portion just along adjacent to Jerusalem and a swap equally amount of land to the Palestinians just east of, of Gaza. That Jerusalem would be shared and so forth. That's another agreement. And I would think the most important one has been the fifth one that I'll mention, and that is the Arab peace proposal that was uh, originated, as you know here, and that was made in 2002, saying to Israel, all 22 Arab countries, with no exceptions, offered Israel full diplomatic recognition within their legal borders, that is the so-called Green Line or the pre-67 borders. And when King Abdullah of uh, Saudi Arabia was questioned about how they would deal with Israel on a trade and commerce basis, he said the same as we deal with each other among our Arab brothers. That was characterized by many people as a basis for peace, and it still exists. So all of the legal frameworks are identical, but they all are predicated on Israel's willingness to negotiate in good faith with the Palestinian leaders, now Abu Mazen, and to reach a conclusion that's compatible with Israel's withdrawing from occupied territories. What is the big unknown? I would say at this moment, it would be the attitude or policy of the next president of the United States. Uh, the United States in the, for the last eight years has been basically aloof from negotiations with spasmodic visits by the Secretary of State, the Foreign Minister, and so forth. But we don't yet know how deeply committed Barack Obama will be to the peace process. He has made a public statement and has told me privately that he will begin this effort early in his term and won't wait until the last year of his eight years in office, as was done by President Clinton and also by, um, by President George W. Bush. So I don't think it's a hopeless case.
but it will depend substantially on the uh, attitude and deep commitment of a, maybe the political courage of uh, the next president of the United States. I don't have any doubts about any of those things concerning Barack Obama, but I know the tremendous political pressures uh, that exist in my nation among political office holders uh, to comply almost without exception to the policies of the Israeli government. It's, it's not easy uh, to, uh, to stand up against that, those pressures. I have devoted more of my time for the last 33 years to this particular issue than any other matter of international consequence. And uh, we'll continue to, to make a, a small effort as a private citizen ahead of a Carter Center uh, in the future. So there are a lot of complexities that I haven't uh, tried to cover because of the press of time. Uh, we've been able to have wonderful talks here with all the pol political leaders uh, in, in uh, Lebanon who were willing to meet with me, and most of them have. Uh, we are looking forward to uh, participating, perhaps if the, if the, uh, if the ministers approve uh, the Carter Center to come back uh, in May or June to monitor uh, what I'm sure will be a very successful election. And I think the recent developments of uh, apparent diplomatic harmony between uh, Syria and uh, Lebanon have been uh, extremely significant. I understand now from the foreign minister that a, a, a place for the Syrian uh, embassy to be located has been identified and is an equally uh, identifiable place uh, in Damascus for uh, your representative there, your ambassador and his staff. And uh, my hope is that there'll soon be a complete exchange of ambassadors and that a, a, a common commission will delineate the border between the two countries. This will be a, a major step forward. And my hope is that in the future, we'll see peace come to this place of, uh, which in my mind is holy. Uh, I teach a Bible lesson every Sunday morning uh, in my little church in home, at home. I happen to be a Christian country by Israelis who so far refuse to leave. And my hope is that these uh, kinds of uh, disturbances can be removed in the near future and we'll all see what we are praying for and as peace in God's world. Thank you very much.